Maybe I'll repeat it later. But uh, anyway, I think it's just cool. I mean, it's neat to have other people lead in uh, worship and stuff. But John and Ryan really are the DNA of the house here. And just seeing them worship together, I, I appreciated that this morning. And also, I'm, I'm calling y'all, y'all, Conestoga's Marines. The few, the proud, the faithful today. Yes, I have it. Thank you. I'm, I'm very detailed Sorry. today. No, that's okay. It's all good. We're a team. Marines. Marines, yes. I was back to the Marines. But just the, I'm, I'm encouraged. We're, we're here. We're here for the glory of the Lord and to love one another. And I just appreciate you guys being here. So, anyhow, I want to open us in prayer. And then I'm uh, hoping my multimedia guys got, got my back. We'll see how we go. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to communicate your word and what you've placed on my heart to share. May it encourage those that are here, God, and for those that might watch this online or listen later, we pray, God, uh, that it would impact them, that you would accomplish what you desire in it all, and that one day we would get to meet them and breathe life into the things that matter most to them. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I actually have a question that I want you to answer. So, like, literally just answer it live. Um, this, for those who are taking notes, the title of today's sermon is Truly Living. And so, my question is this. How would you guys describe, and kids as well, participate. How would you describe someone who truly lived their life? Yeah, shout it out. Go for it. Invested in people. Okay. Somebody you look back at, wow, they really lived their life. Like, wow. How, how would you define that? What would you say? What words would you put to it? He used his gifts. My dad used his gifts till the end. Used his gifts till the end. Amen. Amen. What else? What did you say? Living joyfully. Yep, joy is the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Anybody else? Somebody that you looked at and like they really lived their life. How would you describe that? Free. Free. They were free. Freedom in Christ. Amen. Take one more. Anybody got something else? I'm trying to get you. Givers? They were givers. Amen. Amen. Yeah, giving goes certainly beyond finance, for sure. Um, so be, be thinking about that even more, even, even if you didn't articulate an answer, but just be thinking about that. So my, let's see how we go. Uh, not that I dislike you, Owen, but all right, good. I, feel, I just feel more free now. I feel more free. <laughs> anyway. So, so hydro seeding. All right, now I should have put up another picture, honestly, about this, but I just want to use it as an illustration. Um, so the before and after, you know how you can go from having, and I, it's kind of funny because we got a shed and stuff recently, but go from dirt and nothing to massive life into that ground. And hydro seeding is one approach that can accomplish great things, but it's a picture that shows massive growth is available if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us like the hydro seed in the ground. And again, so I'm not here for necessarily a debate of what's the best approach to get grass to grow. Uh, we had that massive washout, uh, whenever that was, like right when we got it hydro seeded and it like washed everything away down the bank. We had to like get an excavator back to like rebuild the backyard and then reseed it at several different times and ways. Now that we've got is a bunch of burnt patches and it looks kind of hideous, but enough to hold the earth until we get a chance in the fall of the spring. So my hydro seed story, at least this time, didn't go that way. I would have really liked that. But it was just a picture of if we're truly living and we're letting the Holy Spirit accomplish what the Holy Spirit wants to accomplish in and through our lives, then great growth can come forth. So I'm trying to get us to really think about, again, this concept of like, what, how would you describe people that truly lived? That's one thing, but I, I even more so would rather you, you to think about your own life and say, 
if I truly lived, what would that look like? We, we know, even with um, the tragedy recently with Miguel, that one day you could be standing on a boat getting ready to tie something off for somebody and die. And I'm sure he didn't imagine that that was going to be his fate that day. And I pray that, that's, that no tragedy comes to any of us like that. But, as you said, Nancy, you know, to the end, you know, living in, the, in a, such a manner that it was true until the very end of that person's life, I think we need to run the race well and finish strong. And we don't know when finish happens. We don't know when finish occurs. So the, the consistency of the faithfulness of your life day by day matters and you really don't know when time's up so first kind of point I, I wanted to, to make when we think about this concept of truly living and if each of us would truly live for the glory of God you'll never find a more satisfying and fulfilling life than one of complete surrender and obedience anything else is alive from the pit of hell we can tell ourselves many times that these great notions that we conjure up or this picture of the white picket fence and different things is, is my best life now. Is it? Maybe. Maybe if it's linked with the will of God and it's really His best for your life. Yeah, there's books been written on that. <laughs> I appreciate the humor. I like it. So, um, and inside of that, I think there's, there, you know, actually, I read that book, funny enough. I wouldn't have bought it, but somebody gave it to me, so I just felt compelled to read it whenever that was many years ago. But so, the one that's most satisfying, church, is the one that's about complete surrender and obedience. And so, I mean, every, every, everyone that's in this house, really, for the most part today, has been here for a while, and... It's required a lot of surrender, a lot of obedience, a lot of sacrifice in this, in this church. But it goes beyond just planning a church. It's about our whole life. And so if, you're, if there's anything that you have in your mind right now that you feel like, I, you know, this would be so satisfying if I could just, if just this thing could happen, I could accomplish this thing, you know, then I'll really have lived, you know, and you're striving for this thing. And I'm, I am all about goals and dreams, and I'm not telling you don't pursue those things. But just put them on the scale, put them before the Lord's feet and say, you know, are these your things, Lord, that you want me to take action on? And if they are, then they're about His purpose for your life. And inside of that is where you will find true satisfaction and fulfillment. So simply put, what I've been learning in the most recent years is just do what He shows you to do. Don't complain about it and surrender. All, in all areas of life, not some, it's easy to do it in some areas or the church box or we can check our certain boxes, right? I'm just saying your whole life, your everything. For these children, I mean, as parents and even just other adults, them seeing our lives surrendered before God gives them courage to live the same way. And one day their children. The truth is, the Word tells us that we're meant to go from glory to glory. But, but how? I think it's if we yield to the Spirit. Okay, so let's look at 2 Corinthians. This isn't the Amplified Version, but chapter 3, verse 18. And we all with unveiled face, continually seeing as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are progressively being transformed into His image from one degree of glory, even more glory, to even more glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And I loved how it communicated that they were progressively being transformed into His image. So, I think the word progressive is just God's making progress in our lives, church, if we surrender. He is. And he wants to encourage us in that. So don't look at where you're not. <laughs> don't even look just to where you want to be. Recognize he's making progress in your life if you're surrendered to him. And so that's the key. And he wants to take us from glory to glory. And also we know that the word speaks of a hope and a future that we have in that. It's not, you know, I would say the glory isn't necessarily how we define glory. It's God's glory, right? But he, 
But spiritual victories and spiritual breakthrough and effectiveness in our lives, a life where you're truly living, you're alive in Christ on fire for the Lord, these things, even if they're Christian cliches or whatever, those descriptions are where we see ourselves when we're yielding to the Holy Spirit. So are you? And where, perhaps a question, where are you not yielding to the Holy Spirit in your life? And what would God do? What breakthrough would you see if you could just yield in that one area? Challenge to all of us. Taking that kind of thinking a little bit further, though, I was trying to say, okay, like, how would I define truly living? All right? So I would say it's about embracing the concept of how we will never live fully until we come to terms with the fact that we must align with God's plans and purpose for our lives. Then we really come alive. And so it's just, it's not laying down your plans. It's just taking your plans to Him and saying, are these plans your plans? And if they are, awesome, right? But if they're not, then it's where are my plans not in alignment with your plans, God, and how can my plans be put aside so they can be replaced by your plans? That's really what we're talking about. And that comes down to all things. I mean, you know, how we're handling a relationship in our family, how we're, um, <laughs> certainly could be the path we go in our career. You know, uh, I feel like Pastor Ryan's story is a good example. You know, he, he could have just resisted longer, even to planning this church. Right? And maybe Live With Purpose Church wouldn't even exist. Right? But I believe by all of us being surrendered, especially those that were part of the core plant, it was birthed. And that, it, that was essential. That had to happen. So our, we must align with God's plans and purpose for our lives. And it's not like He's sitting there like beating some drum, like upset at us, like, come on, get with the program. He's just saying, it's good. My plan for your life is good. It's more than you can conjure up on your own. It's, it's great. And he just wants us to trust that. You know? And it's scary. Don't get me wrong. I get it. Like We want to be in control. We want to kind of do our own thing. I mean, is there anybody in here that's kind of been at that place before? I just I kind of know what I want to do, and I like to do my thing, right? Yeah. You know, I've, I've been there many times. It's just I, I, I've constantly reminding yourself, constantly asking yourself that question, Lord, is there anything that I'm pursuing that you don't want me to? Is there anywhere where I'm not aligned with what you want me to do? Right? And maybe the answer is no. And you'll be encouraged in that. I'm not here today to tell you if it, if it is or isn't. But it's just something that's an active process. So back to the, even the scripture we saw about that progressive nature of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We've got to keep having that conversation. It's an ongoing thing. I want to give you some practical examples. And we're going to look at a Bible story. Um, but... Okay, some ways that you can truly live now. Like, in the here and now. Like I said before, Miguel, his, his now is now over. Ours isn't. We're here. We're present. So, in the present moment, what are some ways that you could truly live now? Well, first, I would say this. I would say that you can say yes to God. You can always say yes to God. Keyword, always. And stay committed to taking action on the Holy Spirit-inspired vision and dreams that He puts on your heart. Sometimes you get that. I mean, has that happened to you? You're like, God's shown me this thing. I'm supposed to do this. I had a dream, literally, maybe. And like, it's bigger than me. And I don't know how. And then you eventually stop being committed to it. And you stop believing in it. And you stop pursuing it. Or it's like, well, it's back there. And somebody else conjures it back up or resurrects it again. Maybe I'll join in. But I'm certainly, I don't even pray about it anymore. I've stopped even believing if I'm, for real, for real, honest. Yeah. So again, staying committed to, the, to taking action on, on what the Holy Spirit reveals and shows you vision-wise and dream-wise is key. Because if it's, if it's something that He's given you, He's put it in your heart. He wants you to do something about it. And the something is the action. He doesn't need you to know how to pull it all off. He just needs you to take action. And so, action could look very different. Action might even be uh, Mel and Nancy leading us in prayer over there saying, we need to be praying more. Yeah. And I'm going to do something about it. And so, whatever that means, right? That's a very modern, practical example. But 
taking action and staying committed to taking action despite any fear or opposi- opposition. God is always bigger. He's always bigger. Because that's usually what stops us, if we're honest. What stops us is, wow, like I really feel like this one's a God thing and I'm supposed to do it, but like, but how? Or like, whatever. And so I'm afraid to take the very first step. Or like, I felt like I took some steps before and it didn't happen the way I thought, so I just, I'm not wanting to take any more steps. And I'm so paralyzed by the opposition, I don't even want to, I'm just not going to do anything about it. Like, you're just going to have to do something big, God, to get my attention again. And yet, what I've found is really just the consistency of small little steps and small little actions. That's what our life is about. That's what this battle, this spiritual war they're in is about. It's step by step. It's, it's you know, get behind me, Satan, is not a one-time comment, I think. I think there's lots of things. He's the master of lies. He's constantly on the prowl. And yet our God's bigger than every lie that he ever communicates to us. Right? And it's, it's, it's that consistency and that dedication, that commitment to just doing what God shows us to do in that you will truly live, church. You'll live your best life now. Second concept, and I struggle with this at times for sure. Maybe you can relate. But being so present, being so present in life that you consistently make room for any divine encounter or daily assignment that God puts in your path. You know what I'm talking about. Those things that just blow up your day and you're like, this is inconvenient. Oh, I'm not having that. Like, I had my, and I'm a planner, so I completely get this. If you're not a planner, you might be like, well, whatever, just, just kind of roll with it, you know? But for those of you that knew what you're trying to do for the day and then it got blown up, it's like, your day getting blown up might have been the best thing that happened to you in a long time. If you'll actually open your eyes and then, more importantly, do what we just said before, respond. Whatever that response is. And some of you, I've seen you do it, and I feel like you're better at it than me. And so I'm encouraged by you guys. But we need to keep going. So being so present, and and for me, I've even found sometimes just praying this, reminding ourselves, Lord, if there's something you've got today that I'm not understanding is going to be a part of my day, I don't want to miss it. Help me to understand, reveal that to me, Holy Spirit, that this is one of those things. Like, if you've got to, like, cancel a meeting, if you've got to try, drag your screaming kids with you in this thing, you're like, this is not convenient, or whatever, but you know you're supposed to do it, you know? Like, I could just picture, like, my wife, she'd be at the store with, like, the, now the three kids trying to figure that whole thing out, and this person starts talking about how they're struggling with cancer or something, and, like, you know, maybe Jen's supposed to listen and pray with her, and, do you know, I don't know what, what God's going to do, but... Be so present that God can put anything in your path. Because He's he's always at work. He's always doing things. And He knows what we can handle. But sometimes we do things, we respond in situations, and watch what God does, and it blows us away. But it's usually those unexpected moments where we we didn't see it coming. right? And it's a reminder that God is God and we are not. One other kind of thought, again, just trying to create some practical thoughts around how can I truly live my life for God's glory the best way now. Another thought, living a life that models this. Bold faith that relentlessly believes for, contends for, and pursues a constantly brighter future in life that is fueled by a sense of growing purpose. So, that was a lot of words, but this, yeah, living Okay, so you live, you live this type of life. You model this type of life. Bold faith that relentlessly believes for, contends for, and pursues a constantly brighter future in your life that is fueled by a sense of growing purpose. So, God's always got more. God's always bigger. There's always a constantly brighter future if you believe that, if you will trust God. He's fueling it by a sense of a growing purpose in your life. If we can be honest, at some point, we're like, hey, I'm happy. I'm content. And I'm not telling you don't be content, but you just want to stop there and be like, I just, can I just like chill out in this space? Like, I don't really, I don't even know if I need any more. And it's not about what you need. It's about what he wants to do in and through your life. So when you don't say yes to him, who knows what didn't happen, 
right? That you were supposed to be used by God to accomplish. And so really it's, for me, why wouldn't we want a life that has a sense of growing purpose, right? And significance. Your body gets frail, you can't see, maybe even your glasses don't work eventually. I don't know. I mean, I'm just even at, at 40, I start realizing I can't do things that I used to do or whatever. So, you know, no matter where you're at, the, the point is, it doesn't change that your future can be brighter than ever. Your purpose can be greater than ever. Amen. And it's meant to be. Amen. This, is, this is what the Spirit of the Lord would communicate to you. It's, it's not anything less than that. And anything less than that's a lie from the pit of the hell. Like I said in the beginning, you know, Satan does, doesn't want us to believe that. He doesn't want you to have bold faith. He certainly doesn't want you to consistently have bold faith. He doesn't want you to relentlessly believe for anything that God's put on your heart. He wants you to just give it up and flush it down the toilet or stick it in the Rolodex. He doesn't want you to contend for it, to continue to battle and say, I will not, I will, I will not see this thing stopped. If it's the will of God, it will happen. It will be made manifest, period. And you contend for that. And you might contend for that battling on your knees encouraging other people, whatever, whatever it is to, if there's other people, a part of that story that has to happen. Breathing life into it, continually doing that. I believe that things, uh, there was a, a video, Pastor Ryan's seen this just because of our working relationship, and it actually probably Evan would have too. But in the um, recent meetings that we had with our Mastermind Academy, the, there was this video that was talking about, I forget the, I forget the man's name that was the speaker, but he was talking about how the grave is a rich place. Miles Monroe. The, the, the grave is a rich place because people take their treasures with them. Well, and you really aren't, but you, you died with them. Let's put it that way. So the, the books that were supposed to be written, the songs that were supposed to be created, the, the organization you were supposed to launch... Whatever, you fill in the blank. You know, he uses a bunch of different examples. But some of the best stuff that we have that we don't know how to do, we never do anything with, and so we take it to the grave. And so the world never was exposed to the things that the Holy Spirit showed us actually put on our hearts to do. It doesn't mean that the world stops. God's all jacked up because now he doesn't know how to pull it off because we didn't do what we're supposed to do and took it to the grave. But to truly live your best life, like Nancy said in the beginning, it's finishing, it's finishing, it's finishing strong and it's, it, I would say, die empty. Really die empty. Like where you, you can say with assurance, the main things that I feel like God gave me to do, I did them. I did them. And that's, that's really our goal. It doesn't matter your life and how it's stacked up against so-and-so's life. It just means that you, the things that you knew you had to do, you didn't take them to the grave. And I'll, I'll have a good quote for you later. To that point, and I might be getting there soon, but uh, I think we have a Bible story or so first. Now, I've used the story of Joseph many times, and I don't know why I keep coming back to the story of Joseph. It's, I don't think it's just because it's my name, but if it is, pray for me, church. It might be. <laughs> but when I, when I studied this story again, and, and I don't even know if I was studying it for this reason. I think I was just studying it. I saw all three of those things that we just said applied in his story. And I was like, huh, okay. So, if you want to look, um, you can go to Genesis 37. I'll put some up on the screen, but if you're going with me on it, Genesis 37, verses 5 to 11. So the first point, and this, this is three, pra there's three practical things we just talked about. Joseph actually did this. If you look at this, you study out his, the whole picture of what Joseph, what his life looked like. First, the dreams that God gave him, he believed despite family rejection. So, let's look at it. Oop, actually, sorry, I didn't put that one up on the screen, I guess. Let me double check, yeah, okay. So, but let's, let's read that. I think I have it in front of me. So, one night, yeah, it's too big, that's why I didn't put it up, um, sorry. So, one night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brother brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up 
and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, So you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. I mean, he was, he was talking about them because he, I think he really believed them, right? For real, for real. Verse 9, soon Joseph had another dream and he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? Clearly was rejecting the notion that this was of God. But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dream meant. So it shows us a picture of really what was going on in his father's heart. So there was constant rejection of what God put in Joseph's heart, right? And so many times people, even people close to us, will project their fears, but many times yet they'll still be wondering like Joseph's father was. So the, people, so the thing that you feel like God's given you and that people are pushing back on and not believing for, right? Maybe even the closest people to you. What if they're actually wondering if it's true? So don't just take the words that come out of people's mouth that push you back. Don't let that stop you contending and, and staying committed to it. Recognize many times what people say isn't fully what they mean or believe inside. They speak out of fear. They speak out of things that are not of God. And many times that'll stop us dead in our tracks. So we won't do things. And, you know, this story could have been very different if Joseph was like, yep, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I didn't get that right. I, uh, this clearly can't be of God. And, you know, Scripture doesn't record it that way. I think Joseph completely believed that God said what he said and he was going to do what he was going to do. So he was obedient. And when, when we are obedient, God shows off for us. And we'll, we'll see that a little bit more. So, you know, talked about being so present in life. The second point, the second practical point I made. So present in life that you can make room for these divine encounters. Well, so jo Joseph did that. You know, he, he um, I don't know that I'm going to put those scriptures up. But if you, if you look at Genesis 40, you can see this. Joseph's gifting blesses the cupbearer in prison and restores his fortunes. He asks people, remember me. But he was present, even in a place where you might be like, I don't want to be present. I'm in a nasty cell pit, man, like, and like, just don't talk to me. And God's not real, and he didn't speak to me in his stupid dreams, and like all this stuff that could have been going through if your flesh was all jacked up. But, but Joseph was so present that he made room for these divine encounters that God was going to use, not just the record in here, but to change his life and the lives of many other people. And then the third point, so back to these practical kind of applications, you know, a life that modeling a life of bold faith that believes for, contends, pursues a constantly brighter future. I believe that. You know, that was a long span of time that Joseph had to deal with that. So he was clearly doing these things, church, that we're talking about. If I was in his shoes, I would hope I would do that. But man, I think it's pretty amazing, honestly. When you look at some of the people in the Bible and what they did, and, and they just completely believe it's like, all right, well, whatever, however this is going to go down, Lord, I'm in it. I'm in it till the end, till you take me. So Joseph trusted God. He clearly trusted God, right? And then what happened? His dream was fulfilled, right? So that might be your dream, and you're like, well, I haven't seen it, and it's been months or years and decades even. I don't know what it is. God controls the timeline. Let him be in charge. He is anyway, so why don't we just acknowledge it for what it is? But Joseph trusted God. Joseph's dream was fulfilled. He creates a seven, you, you guys probably know the story, but he creates a seven year kind of food storage system for Egypt, saves the people from a, ma a massive famine that they're going to face. Look at uh, Genesis 41 for that. 
He sees God reconcile broken relationships with his father and brothers by giving them all a brighter future, right? So many times, if you guys will just be in agreement, be in alignment with what God has for you and do what he wants, it, it's a ripple effect that affects the lives of many other people. It's not even just for you. So when you don't, when you're not obedient, you're actually hurting other people, other people that you don't even know sometimes. And so, again, if you need a sense of growing purpose in that, recognize that, that the Holy Spirit moves, God does things just because, just because you showed up and truly lived your life for His glory. He does things, no matter how short or long the rest of your life is. So when we look at that, let's look at Genesis 47, verses 5 and 6. I do have that on screen. But it reads, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, now that your father and your brothers have joined you here, choose any place in the entire land of Egypt for them to live. Give them the best land of Egypt. Sounds pretty cool. Let them live in the region of Goshen. And if any of them have special skills, put them in charge of my livestock too. So not only is Joseph second in all of Egypt, but his whole family is completely blessed, right? By Joseph's faithfulness and commitment to believe in God and the, the vision that the Holy Spirit revealed to him through the dreams. So, because Joseph truly lived, they were blessed. And not only was his family blessed, the whole nation was blessed. People were saved, honestly, in reality. Not only like physically saved, clearly from famine, but also spiritually saved. Um, so, I think when you look at that, he, he could have never dreamed that up. I mean, it's, it's not even like up front. I mean, and what, what kind of faith would be required if God showed him a dream like, you know, where it was very clear, like, you're going to go through exactly all these things, and here's all the details, and how it's completely going to play out. Now just go do it. I think we would, prob we would probably complain, but all do the things God would have for us if he would completely map it out, I would hope. Maybe, maybe I'm being overzealous with that. But he, he just, he didn't do that. He, he gave Joseph what Joseph needed. And then Joseph took action as he was supposed to. And then God showed off. And that's kind of my point with those three applications. That how will God show off in your life if you will just trust Him completely? Last point I have <clears throat> for today is this. So, I have a couple quotes I want to use to reinforce this, but... If you choose or settle for a life that is based on being comfortable, easy to do. Easy to do. But if you settle for a life that is based on being comfortable, and you get to define what that looks like, many times that is a lesser version of, than what God has created you to be. Okay? Is that important to you? I don't know. Do you, do you actually want to be all that God designed you to be? Do you want to? I think he's inviting you into that. Reminding of us of that again today. If true, you will never fully discover what God intended for your life until you meet your maker when time's up, not the ideal time, as you give an account of your life. Let's look at a couple quotes. So... This pastor said this really well. I, I just it stood out to me as I, I tend to jockey through a couple different books. But two quotes that I just wanted to put out there that kind of reinforce some of this. Instead of pressing the limits of what God could do in and through our lives, we assume that His intention for us is less. And so we settle for what we can do rather than what God intended to do through us. Right? And also, this one hit me even more. Too many of us, too many, I'm sorry, too many of us act as if we're going to live forever or that life can wait until we're ready to live it. And that's not true when we, again, I keep looking back at Miguel because of the recent story, but you don't know when time's up so you better get on with living it right now. 
That's, that's kind of the bottom line. And again, you guys get to fill in what that is. And this church is all about wanting to partner with you in that, walk with you in that, encourage you in that. So again, if you're, some of you have already taken up time to talk with Pastor Ryan and myself and just be like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Or like, but I feel like this is what the Lord's got for me. Well, we want to invest in that. So share this, believe, contend for it, come to us, talk with us. Let's pray together, whatever it looks like. But I really feel like if, you, if we can take heart from some of these challenges in the quote, we can see if I'm really able to shift now and start to truly live to, to, to get beyond comfort and do the things, if there's something there that the Lord showed you, like, I know I'm supposed to do this, but I just I haven't wanted to step out of the boat yet. If you step out of the boat, how will it affect other people? And what will God do? How will He show off in and through your life? I mean, we looked at Joseph's story and what he did there for, and how it blessed his family and many other people. Same God, different story. It's just your life now. What's He going to do through that, right? And, you know, some other kind of thoughts around that, though. Sometimes we can get it like in a holy huddle, churchy bubble, whatever you want to call it. But Christians really aren't immune to this. I mean, it's, it's not as if like, oh, yes, you know, those, those heathens out there, yeah, you know, they could just, you know, they could understand who God was and do, do the right things. They, this is really everybody. I think, you know, many, many Christians won't follow the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit's leading them. Right? What's worse with that is we have the Spirit within us, we understand and see the revelation, and we do nothing with it. You know, the world that has closed minds, darkened hearts, they can't see and understand and discern the things. Or even if it's presented to them, they don't really spiritually discern what God's showing them. But we do. We know what He has. And yet we're not doing anything with it. I think that, that, grieves, the, that grieves the Holy Spirit. And I would hope that none of us would want to be in that place. So... Like the hydro seeding example from the beginning that I used, 2018, again, for our sign that's on the door that you always see when the computer's up and whatnot, this year was a year of growing deeper with God and with others. Colossians 2, 6-7. And just reminding us again of... of what we're, we're trying to grow in and walk out this year. And now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, so if you've made Him the Lord of your life, you must continue to follow Him as the Holy Spirit leads you and shows you these things. Let your roots grow down into Him and let your lives be built on Him. So in every aspect of life, whatever He shows you, be willing to do it. No matter how it messes your day up, no matter what, whatever opposition you would have to push back on then your faith will grow strong that sounds like a pretty good thing in the truth that you're taught and that you're being taught as God's continuing to work in and through you and you'll overflow with thankfulness I'm sure Joseph was and his whole family it was overflowing with thankfulness to see what God did right and so that's what God's going to do he's going to show off church he's going to he's going to show up and blow up things and, and he's going to be glorified in it all and you're going to be amazed but it requires your action. And I don't know what the action is, but you got to fill in that blank. Just some thoughts. I mean, Ephesians 4, we're not going to put it up, but Ephesians 4 teaches us how we're truly meant to ignite one another in our dreams and the things that God puts in our hearts. So I know, John, we talked before about music and producing albums and things that you're kind of like, I don't know, like, what's God going to do with this? But I believe these are, that, that's an example, man. You're one. You're one of them that I'm thinking of that's on my heart when I preach this message. Gina's not here today, but the, the day I met her, counseling and things that have evolved since that we've talked about, like potential ch marketplace chaplaincy. She shared these dreams with me the day I met her at our conference room before we ever knew we would hire her. And yet, fast forward a number of years later, still continuing to invest in her life and ch challenge her and encourage her that God has these things you're supposed to walk it out. You're supposed to do something with it. So she could even get comfortable in just her relationship with me and what we've got going on and not take those steps. And I won't condemn her if that's the case, but I believe God's got more. And I believe that this church now and her family's involvement, I hope she hears this message, is 
being used to spur her on, right? We're meant to one another. So as you, I'm just putting out a couple examples here. I have a couple more, but as I'm doing that, it's like just encourage one another, church. We have a potluck today. It's a small group, whatever. But as you see opportunities to just revisit things with people and talk about what God's put on their heart and like just help to tell them like keep going. You can do it. Like I believe in you. That might be the very thing that they need to get them to step forward. Or I know with the Gray Bills and with Renee's family, we've talked about the vision, the glory house, and everything associated with that. And we've had these conversations, and like, what are you going to do, God? What could happen? I don't believe that these things that we've talked about were just things to talk about. I believe that God wants to do something with it. And so I don't know exactly how all that plays out. But all that I've witnessed so far inside of Live With Purpose Church is God doing, honestly, miraculous things with the few, the proud, the Conestoga Marines. I mean, honestly, you guys are awesome. I wish everybody in the whole church was here today so they could hear the same thing. But, but we've got more. It's just begun. We're just beginning. And we, we, have, to, we have to believe that with all of our hearts. So these things, like I, nothing more would please me as one of the pastors in this church to see you guys take these steps of courage and action and to see God just show off and see what he does in just to be like, yeah, I got to be a fly in the wall. I got to be a part of that. That was so cool. You know, I, rem I remembered when they just said, like Joseph to his father and his brothers, I had this dream and, you know, all that. He was just communicating. He was excited about it. But I remember when you guys were excited about these things. And again, it's not even just to isolate those people in those specifics. But again, fill in the blank. And if you've got stuff that you haven't communicated, even the kids, like if you've got something that you haven't said yet, that you feel like God wants to use you for and to do something about, it doesn't matter if it's many years to come, but tell us about it. Let us just encourage you. Let us disciple you, walk with you, and, and, and help you figure out like how could, how could you do something about that, right? But it's not my job. It's not Pastor Ryan's job. It's all of our jobs, because you all uniquely have something different. Our gifts are different. Some of you are great with compassion and showing mercy. Some of you are so great at so many different things. So let's exercise them to the benefit of one another. And I'm not saying be selfish and just about us, just in-house. That's clearly not what I'm saying. But let's not overlook one another. Where again, we're, we're together for a reason. You know? And it, it, you could say, well, this is practically how that happened. Or we, we were over at Into Light Ministries and we can't, you know. Or whatever your part of the story is. But we're still together for a reason. And that's still true this day. And so what does God want to do? I mean, these are foundational in what our church's mission is all about. And I, and I just feel like the Holy Spirit's reminding us again today that we've just begun and He's got more. And so we have to believe that. We have to believe that. And believing that means that we'll take action and it will help one another take action where we need to. Uh, I don't know, John, anybody worship? If one of you guys come back up, I'd appreciate that. We're going to look to close. But it'd be helpful if you could just lead me out here. I want to pray for us, um, but I'll remain up front. And if anybody wants prayer, because and you don't have to come forward for me. But even as we're breaking bread together, if it's not me, get with somebody and ask them to pray for you. If there's some aspect of your um, of a dream, a vision, something he's put on your heart but there's something that's holding you back from living that out now and you know that and you can recognize that I think this is a safe place we can be vulnerable in that and certainly we can trust God and so um, closes in prayer but again if that's you don't just enjoy the fellowship and the food today do business with God. Let us ignite one another. Let us love one another. Let us pray for one another. I want to see the things that He has for you. I look forward to seeing these young kids grow up and become amazing men and women of God and seeing them do things that we've never done. It's a blessing to be a part of this small church. But that's that's now. You know, that, that's right now. We need to continue to bless one another. 
And just bring what you have. The same spirit that's in you raised Christ from the dead. Who knows what God will do through the Holy Spirit's work. Just through your obedience, through your encouragement, through your loving people, through your praying for people. And again, I bless the Landises and them always being prayer warriors and helping us to start that over in the other building again. God's got more, church. Let us pray. God, we're thankful for all that you've done. All that we can't even remember that you've done. I'm asking not just today, but certainly today, God, as we go forward in this week, as you continue to give us life, reveal to us, Holy Spirit, all the victories, the things that you did, the things that were accomplished in our life that we've forgotten. May we overflow, as the Word showed us, with thankfulness when we look back at these things. Holy Spirit, we need You to use us and those that You're drawing to us to ignite these visions, these dreams that You've placed within us. I'm asking that You'd give my brothers and my sisters, young and old, courage, boldness, that they would believe and contend for these things. That they would not just settle for the okie doke in life. That they would believe fully as Joseph did to what you showed that you would bring it to fruition. And it doesn't even matter if it doesn't come to fruition in and through our lives. If you choose to use our life to break ground for something that's going to be carried forward later like David's son, Solomon. If our life that's truly lived now for your glory and for your honor, Lord Jesus, is to pass the torch to somebody else related to us or not, may we say yes and amen to these things. If we pray and we believe that we really mean this, may your will be done, Father, on earth as it is here in heaven. Hallowed be your name. If we believe this as we pray, if we pray as you've shown us, Jesus, as you've modeled in your holy scriptures, if we believe this, then we must contend for this. And we need your help, God. Holy Spirit, we need you because our flesh is weak. But in you, Christ, we can do all things. May we remind one another that we can do all things. Everything else is just a lie from the master of lies. We have access to all things that we need from heavenly places. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. If our lives are built upon Him, all things are possible. You've testified of this in Your Word. And we believe that Your Word is infallible. That You breathed life into it. That it's not just a book that we read of historical thoughts. That it's truth. May our lives be built upon it, God. And anywhere, anywhere where there's been a chink in our armor where that's not true. And we're not fully sold out. And we're not completely surrendered. My heart breaks for those that we've even gotten to know in our midst in this church family. That are not here. And not because of vacations and other things. But people that have, have settled for less than what you have, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work. That you would bring forth new vision and understanding and revelation of what you have for their lives. And may you get them to the place where they will just respond in obedience. May we be encouraged one day when we see and hear the mighty exploits that you've done. In and through their lives. We pray for this town of Conestoga, God. That we might even bring this message with us into fun day. That we'd encourage people where they're stuck. Where they believe that God, that you won't show up. That you're not who you say you are. We reject that. You are who you say you are. And you're glorious, God. You love us dearly. You birth vision. And give us insight and to your throne as we see the things that you have for our life. Our life is fleeting. 
We're here for only a moment. But God, may we, may we finish well. And we, may we do that by living well now. May we be truly alive in you, Christ. Not over-spiritualizing, over-complicating this, but just completely sold out and surrendered for you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. If you can stay for the food, stay. If you need prayer, I'm here. We love you guys. Your triumphal cross is never failing. It's never failing. So take courage, my heart. Stay steadfast, my soul. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. So hold on to your home as your triumphal cross. It's never fair, it's never fair.